apologise for that, but I think you'll find this a bit more interesting. The following podcast is going to contain spoilers, along with me, just a regular guy, talking about all the things I love, such as comics, movies, television, music, and books. So yeah, proceed at your own risk. Welcome to another episode of Just Another Fanboy. I'm your host, Steven, and this is episode number 100. Yay! It's really hard to just freaking celebrate when you're sitting alone. So all I can really do is go, yay. I mean, I might get a woohoo and a yeah, yeah out of it, but, you know. I mean, I am excited, don't get me wrong, but... There's no music playing. I'm not dancing. I'm just sitting in my car celebrating 100 episodes. And I figured, what better way to celebrate 100 episodes than to talk about a comic that has celebrated 100 issues back in 1946. So yeah, I'm talking about Action Comics number 100 from September of 1946. This was written by Alvin Schwartz with pencils by Ira Yarborough and inks by Stan Kay. Now, if you're not aware, Action Comics at this time was an anthology book. This book had at least three stories in it, but the digital version that I purchased only has the Superman tale as they have digitized their back catalog of action comics. DC apparently only focused on the Superman stories, which I think is a bit of a shame, frankly. I mean, granted, I didn't pay full price for the issue because it's only 13 pages, but still, I kind of would have liked to have read those other stories. But that's all right. That's all right. Because we're here to talk about this one. This story is entitled The Sleuth Who Never Failed. And it's about a dude who is a Detective for Scotland Yard, and he's like the best detective ever. His name is Hawkins, and he's just solving crimes all over the place. And as the issue opens, he is approaching Clark Kent at the Daily Planet, and he's like, oh, pardon me, sir. Can I talk to you in private, Mr. Superman? And Clark's like, what? What did you call me? Oh, it's okay, Superman. Your secret's safe with me. And Clark's all, hey, buddy. I'm not Superman. What are you talking about? That's crazy talk, buddy. I mean, sure, flattering to be mistaken for such a manly, godlike figure, but I'm not Superman. And then as the reader, we're left to wonder, who the frick is this guy? And so we're taken back into a flashback. Seven years ago, or seven years ago as of 1946, we go back to Scotland Yard, and we see this guy... This mustachioed mystery man, we learn his name is Hawkins, and he is a detective for Scotland Yard, and he's bringing in a criminal to the inspector. He's like, here you are, inspector, the Salem Strangler. Hmm, <laughs> another crime cracked, another case solved. And the inspector's all like, blimey! I don't actually think he says blimey. There's one part of the book where uh, the Cockney accent is just written so poorly, but The inspector, of course, is very impressed and immediately hands him over another case. I mean, Hawkins shows up. He's he's kind of a a little dude, kind of, and he's he's kind of barrel shaped and he's got a big mustache and a bowler hat and he's holding a gun to this criminal's back. And he's like, here you go, inspector, Here's the criminal. And the inspector is just like, that's great. Here's another case. They don't process the guy. He doesn't fill out any paperwork. It apparently Scotland Yard is very efficient. So he hands him another case, but he says, good luck with this one because nobody, nobody in the building, nobody has been able to solve this. And Hawkins is like, fear not, Inspector, I shall have this case cracked in 24 hours. And sure enough, later that night, 
he's at this pub and he's talking to what we have to assume is the proprietor. And he's like, I'm here to get the ox. That's the criminal he's after. And the 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 proprietor, here's the part where I don't I don't have it written down in front of me, but he's they just they're just laying on what the American writer has to assume is a Cockney accent. And he's like, Eh, governor, bloy me, and all that. And how can you think the ox is ear in my place? And so Hawkins explains his bit of deduction. It's very simple. He points out a bald waiter and he tells the waiter, step forward. Now I know that you only hire young men in this pub and this man is bald, which means he's old. So he has to be the ox in disguise. And they're like, what? That's that's kind of a leap, don't you think? And he rips the bald cap off of the dude and sure enough, it's a guy with hair. So obviously... He's the ox, right? They don't really explain. They just, ha ha, bald cap, you're the ox. And the proprietor sneaks up behind Hawkins. He's got one of those freaking tiny leather billy club looking flappy things that you use to knock people out. But Hawkins, standing there in his bowler hat, holding his umbrella, he knows it's going to happen. He's like, ha ha, I knew this was going to happen. And he just calmly grabs the guy and flips him over and slams him onto his back, still holding onto his umbrella. So he takes this guy back to Scotland Yard. Two apparently high-profile criminals, two major cases cracked in the same day. That's how awesome this guy is. And then he tells the inspector that he's retiring. I've caught, he's basically saying, I've caught all the criminals in London, and now I want to pursue a personal matter, a case that I've been trying to solve for a long time. I know that Superman has a secret identity. And here's the weird thing about this. So I've always thought, I've always assumed that the reason why Superman has a secret identity is to protect his loved ones. And in this case, his mother and his father, Mom and Pa Kent. I mean, that's why Spider-Man has a secret identity. Not really sure why Batman has a secret identity. His loved ones are dead. Sorry to bring it down, but it's true. Well, in this issue, they, they explain that the reason why Superman has a secret identity is because as Clark Kent, he he basically has sources in the underworld because he's a reporter. So he has sources and he can use those sources to catch bad guys. And if these sources knew that Clark was Superman, of course, they wouldn't give him any of this information. So that is the reason given as far as why Superman has a secret identity, which I guess makes sense. But it seems, I don't know, the idea of keeping your identity secret so your enemies don't go after your mother and your father, two frail old people living in Kansas, that seems to make more sense to me. So we're back to the present after having had Hawkins, his, uh, his backstory filled in for us. And he tells Clark that he knows he's Superman and they can solve this really quick if he just give him a bit of his hair, just a little snip. And he pulls out his own scissors. And Clark is about to reply when Lois Lane shows up. She just comes walking up and she's like, oh, what's this? What's going on? You know, she's a reporter. She's, she smells a story. Oh, what's going on? Who's this? Who are you talking to? And Clark's like, oh, well, hello, Lois. Meet Detective Hawkins. And Hawkins turns his back on Clark to reach out and take her hand. And he's like, oh, charmed, I'm sure. And in that moment, Clark, using his super speed, launches out of the Daily Planet, goes into a costume shop that specializes in wigs, snatches a wig off of one of those freaking mannequin heads, and is back to the Daily Planet within like a fraction of a second. So fast that when he when he zooms through this wig shop, these papers that the 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 owner or the the shopkeeper is sitting at a desk and these papers fly off the desk and he's like, "Oh, who turned on that fan?" So Clark is back and he's wearing a wig. Of course, we can't tell he's wearing a wig. It looks like his natural hair and he's like, "Here you go, inspector. Snip away." And Hawkins takes a little bit of his hair. He goes back to his hotel room where he's got a crime lab set up, which apparently just consists of a microscope. And he's looking at the hair under the microscope. And he he says out loud, just as I suspected, it's fake hair. This is animal hair, which means it came from a wig. So he expected this to happen. (laughs) You know, I'm going to go get hair off a clock, Kent, but I know he's going to trick me. But that by itself 
doesn't prove that Clark Kent is Superman. As as he he he's thinking to himself and he's like, either Clark Kent is wearing a toupee or he's trying to trick me. Of course, he suspects that he's being tricked. He's already decided that Clark is Superman. One part of the story that I kind of passed over is that after he tells the inspector he's retiring to go figure out who Superman is, they show that he spends seven years in Europe. He doesn't even go to America at this point. He, he spends seven years in Europe combing over all this evidence, going through freaking libraries and newspaper morgues and museums and just just gathering all this evidence. They show at one point somebody brings him someone named Carter. Thank you, Carter. Brings him a mold impression of a footprint that apparently is Superman's that he left behind during the Egypt adventure, which I'm assuming is a thing in one of these other 99 issues of Action Comics. I don't know if they're actually referencing something that really happened. But he's also got on this wall, I ass I'm assuming they're supposed to be photographs. They look just, because it's a comic book, they look like line drawings, just black and white line drawings. But they're of Clark Kent and Superman's face, respectively. He's got both front view and side view. And they're huge. He's up on a freaking platform that's like 10 feet off the ground, and he's measuring the distance between Superman's eyes and comparing it to the distance between Clark's eyes. And he's like, everything is, is, is exact. It's exact proportions. But that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that's not the key piece of evidence he needs at this point. So that's when he goes to America. So that's the end of the backstory. So Clark tricks him with the wig, and Hawkins figures he needs to step it up a notch, and he concocts this plan, which, when you really think about it, if Clark Kent was not Superman, and Hawkins is completely wrong, this plan that I'm about to go into would end with Clark Kent's death. So he bribes this bank employee, he looks like a security guard, he bribes him to lock Clark Kent in the vault overnight. Apparently, Clark, every night, he's got important Daily Planet documents that Perry White sends him to the bank every day with this stuff, and he goes back in the vault, and he puts it in a safety deposit box. And so Hawkins bribes this security guard to lock the vault door when Superman goes in, because it's always the end of the night. It's just foreclosed. And so when Clark goes into the vault... The employee shuts the vault door, locks it, and he doesn't seem to be all too upset about this, the bank employee. He's getting paid a whole $500 to, as far as he's concerned, commit murder. He doesn't, unless Hawkins has told the security guard, hey, here's the thing, good man, I believe Clark Kent is Superman. In fact, I'm about 100% sure, well, maybe 99.999% sure, but we're going to prove it by locking him into the vault, and you'll see that Superman will burst out of the vault, proving that Clark is Superman. But not to fear if I'm wrong, I, you will not, I will take full responsibility. And that seems to be okay with this guard. He's like, all right, as long as I'm not responsible for killing a man. So Clark is in the vault, and he realizes that this is something that Hawkins put together. And so he's got to figure out a way out that's not going to expose him as Superman. So he uses his heat vision to open up a section of the vault door from the inside and get access to its guts. And basically, he accesses the time lock and changes the time to the current time so that the door just goes ahead and opens up. The, the door thinks it's morning, and it opens. Then he uses his heat vision to smooth the metal back out to put it in place so it doesn't look like he's tampered with it. Then he goes out into the bank which is closed by this point, and he finds the burglar alarm to trip it, which apparently is just a wire running along the floor because he just kind of pulls up this wire. The alarm goes off. He goes back into the vault, and he closes the door, and then the police burst in. So even though this vault has a time lock on it, apparently you can still access it from the outside, I guess, if you have a key or a combination or something because the, the door opens, two cops burst in, and they're like, Dear God, it's Kent from the planet! And there's Clark Kent, and he's on the floor, and he's acting like he's out of breath. He's like, oh, just in the nick of time. Thank you. Oh, I was almost dead. And so 
They rescue him, thinking that the burglar alarm thing was an accident, which turned out to be lucky because it saved Clark's life. Well, this infuriates Hawkins. The next morning, he's out for a walk. He buys a copy of the Daily Planet. He sees the headline that Clark Kent survives because of a lucky accident. And he's like, curses, I must take it up even another notch. And as he's walking along, he comes across a perfume factory called Linger Forever. So he calls Clark, disguising his voice, and he tells him, come on down to the perfume factory. I'll get you the smelliest story ever. Clark comes down. He recognizes Hawkins right away, who is in disguise, which is only a set of white coveralls and an even bigger mustache. <laughs> and he's like, come with me, Mr. Kent, and I will give you a story. And he takes him into the, the factory and pushes him into a vat of perfume, just this big open, bubbling vat of perfume. And then he runs away. Ha ha ha, I've done it. And he, he leaves. He just leaves him there. And his thought process is, this perfume is so strong that even when he's Superman, he's, he's going to smell like this perfume, despite what clothes he's wearing. And so now all he has to do is wait till he is Superman and sniff him out and go, ha ha, you smell just like Clark Kent. Therefore, you must be Clark Kent. And so that evening... Superman is going to speak at a rally for veterans' rights. It's going to be held outdoors, and there's supposed to be rain, which doesn't really tie into the story at all. There's this whole thing with the rain that doesn't really tie into the story. I guess it's just there to show that Superman is really cool and show off his powers because Hawkins shows up to the, to the rally, and as he's heading there, there's this panel where Superman is flying by. He's up in the sky. He's flying by and he's trailing a banner behind him that basically says something like, come to the rally, rain or shine. You know, he's just letting everybody know, don't worry, I'm still going to be there, even if it's raining. And so when Hawkins gets there, he goes right to the front and he sniffs Clark. You don't see him doing it, but he's standing there up front looking up at Clark on the stage and he's like, curses, he doesn't smell like perfume. Because what had happened... After he got dunked into the perfume and Hawkins ran away, ha ha, he doesn't, I don't actually, he doesn't laugh. That's just what I'm assuming. I'm, there's a lot that happens outside of the panels because it's only a 13 page story. Well, Clark gets out and he changes to Superman and he flies over to a chemical factory and just swoops in and dives straight into a giant open vat. A lot of these factories just have these giant open vats of chemicals and he dives into this open vat of sulfuric acid and he starts basically just having a bath he's scrubbing himself and he's using that acid to take the smell away and so hawkins later is like curses he no longer smells like perfume i have but only one option left i must resort to criminal methods well in the meantime clark is up on stage and he's telling all the veterans don't worry folks even though it's raining, I'll make it go away. And he's got this big steel girder with him. And he starts spinning it over his head. And in case the, the, the people in the crowd that are watching him, in case they don't understand quite what's going on, he explains to everybody what he's doing. See, as I spin this girder so fast, it becomes white hot, evaporating the rain as it falls. Again, it has nothing to do with the story, but I think it's just there. So the writer can say, see, look, here's Superman doing something Superman-like. So Hawkins, as he said, has to resort to criminal methods, which is just breaking into Clark's apartment and rifling through all his belongings. Superman shows up. He flies in through the window of his apartment, luckily lands in the one room that Hawkins is not in. But he can hear Hawkins, and he uses his x-ray vision, and he sees him in this other room rifling through things. And he's like, oh, good Lord. Well, I'm going to have to do something about this. But if he moves on to the next room, he's going to surely find evidence that I am Superman and Clark Kent, that we are one and the same. Apparently, there's something in the other room. They don't explain what. Maybe if you're a, if you were a current reader at the time, maybe you know of this other room. I don't know. Maybe it's full of Superman costumes. And I, I don't know. But he basically says, I've got, I, I figure it'll take him about 10 minutes to finish rifling through the room that he's in before he goes into the other room. So I have to do something. And he takes out a piece of paper and he writes on it. And then he flies out the window and he goes, I have 10 minutes to age this document 
10 years. And he flies up into the stratosphere, into the sub-zero temperatures. He flies down into a rainforest through a tropical storm and then through the humidity of this rainforest. And then he flies to the Sahara and, you know, all the while he's got this document with him and now he's going through the dry, arid deserts of the Sahara. And then he flies back to his apartment. He sticks the, the, the document in his desk drawer and then he goes back outside. And he's outside floating there and he's watching everything through his x-ray vision. And Hawkins finally comes into the room where the desk is. Now, I'm assuming this is the very same room that will have surefire evidence that Clark and Superman are the same. I don't know where the evidence is. He doesn't explain where the evidence is. He's banking, uh, apparently, on Hawkins going immediately to the desk and maybe not throwing open a closet and finding all the Superman costumes. He doesn't, they don't, they don't go into any of that. But sure enough, he goes into the desk and he pulls out this document and it's Clark's will. Basically, he had, he had created a quick will and he had dated it 10 years previous. And then going through all this, this stuff, it aged the paper it yellows the paper and it fades the ink and in his will he bequeaths his good friend superman his library and so that at that point hawkins is like well i guess there's really no contesting the fact that this document is 10 years old and if it's his will and he's bequeathing something to superman then obviously they are two different people so he leaves and superman's like yay yeah, well, a couple of days later at the Daily Planet, Jimmy Olsen brings him a letter and he's like, Clark, it's a letter from England. Clark's reading the letter and it's from Hawkins, who's basically telling him, I apologize for all that I put you through. Uh, I'm going to be presenting my findings to my inspector on Friday. Going to be telling him the success that I have come across. And Clark's like, what? Success? What does that mean? I thought I tricked him. Today's Friday. And so he changes to Superman and he quickly flies to England and he goes to Scotland Yard and he's floating above Scotland Yard and he's using his hearing and his x-ray vision to watch as Hawkins is presenting his findings to the inspector. And he's just saying, Inspector, after all this time and blah, 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 I have finally come to the conclusion that I was right, that Clark Kent is not Superman. And then it goes from there to the final panel. Superman is standing on the roof of Scotland Yard and he's kind of shrugging with his hands held up in the air like, you know, like, eh, that kind of pose, eh. And he's saying, well, I guess if the greatest detective Scotland Yard has to offer says it's true, then it must be. And you can almost hear a one up bop ba up bop and then the episode, the issue's over. It's done. That's it. <laughs> it was pretty fun. It was, you know, it's amazing how... These issues, these stories, 13 pages, they pack so much into these 13 pages and yet leave so much out at the same time. Because in 13 pages, we find, we get Hawkins' backstory, we get Hawkins pulling various stunts on Clark Kent to expose him as Superman. We get Clark Kent filling out a will and aging it 10 years in 10 minutes. And it's just, there's just so much that happens in these 13 pages. And yet, again, at the same time, there is they, they tell you so little just so they can pack it all in. There's so much that they leave out, so much explanation that they just hope that the reader will just be like, eh, it's a comic book. Who cares that the, that the bank guard was ready to commit murder for $500, which I have to assume was a lot of money back then. I mean, to want to help somebody potentially kill a reputable Daily Planet reporter like Clark Kent, somebody he obviously knows because he's like, hey, Mr. Kent, as Clark comes in. We don't know that guy's backstory. I feel like somebody needs to tell a story about that guy, that security guard, why he was so willing to kill Clark Kent. Because again, we don't know. We, we have to assume that Hawkins, just based on what little evidence they presented, he just, he just approaches the security guard and he goes, hey, buddy, I'll give you $500 if you lock Clark Kent in this vault overnight. $500? Well, he could die. Don't worry about it. I'll be responsible. Well, all right then. Bam. You know, there's got to be more to that story. Does he have a gambling problem? Does he owe somebody money? And the people he owes money to, maybe they have his freaking wife. They, they, they've kidnapped her and they're going to kill her by midnight if he doesn't give them the money and then just as a coincidence, 
Hawkins comes in and offers him that amount of money that he needs to save his wife, I feel like we need to explore that story a little bit more. But we're not going to do that here. We're not going to do that today. This was episode number 100 of Just Another Fanboy, folks. 100 episodes. Let's hope for 100 more. Again, we're going weekly at this point as we roll into the summer because of everything that's going on and the amount of time I have currently in my life. Hopefully we can get back to two episodes a week at some point. But for now, once a week, which means I'll see you again next Thursday. And until then, my name is Steven and I'm Just Another Fanboy. Be nice to each other. Stay safe. Just Another Fanboy is a presentation of the Stephen or Else podcast. Questions and comments can be directed to feedback at stephenorelse.com. You can support the show for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash stephenrorr and get instant access to the My Other Podcast podcast, a weekly show about whatever crawls its way into my tiny little mind just moments before I tap record. You can find me on the World Wide Web at stephenorelse.com or find me on Twitter and Instagram by searching for at Stephen or else. I also encourage you to subscribe to the show, leave us a five-star review, and share this episode with a friend. Just Another Fanboy is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. You can find that over at comicspodcasts.com. All links will be in the show notes. Good job. Ooh.